folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. When I first started studying the number three, yeah, we're still on that one, and I've got some more uh, that I'm going to share maybe here in, in a little while. But anyway, when I first started studying the number three, I was not expecting to find what I found. I mean, after all, uh, you know, we started out with the number three being, you know, representing the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the, or the Word, and the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, First John 5, 7. Try that, Mr. NIV or New American Standard or Holman Christian Standard or English Standard or any other standard Bible. First John 5, 7 is not in there. That's why you use the King James. But anyway, I was at... I, 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 I found all this wonderful stuff about the Godhead and how, you know, perfect it is in the beginning. That's time. God created the heaven, that space and the earth, that's matter. And that shows you God's signature, you know, in his creation and so on. And even even just now, uh, I was just sitting here thinking about I wonder what's in the third chapter of the New Testament. And I use this. When we were talking about the Godhead, I just didn't, I didn't count. And in Matthew chapter 3, third chapter of the New Testament, the Bible says Jesus, when he was baptized, you know, death, burial, resurrection, went up straight away out of the water and lo, the heavens were open unto him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I think it sounded better than what I just gave it. But anyway, the whole Godhead thing is right there. These three in chapter three, it's like, why didn't I see that before? That's the beauty of it. Because there are people right now that are, that are counting things in the Bible. And I, I'm just amazed. Uh, one guy writes a book on, I think, the King James and the number seven. It's like, that's sick or whatever. And, uh, it, you know, hey, count things. See what God shows you from his magnificent word. There may, there may be even numbers that I haven't got to yet, or I just, I haven't, they haven't entered my mind to study them yet. And other people have, and they've called me and I think, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, and some things I don't agree with, but you know, anyway, Hey, we're all looking inside of our Bibles and what can go wrong with that? So, we started out, we were talking about three being the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That's what you have here in the third chapter of the New Covenant. And then, you know, like on day three, in fact, I have that starting out here. Uh, it's the number four resurrection because the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, I love 1 Corinthians 15. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Because Paul explains it, he's so simple. He said, the resurrection, take, just take seed, put it in the ground, cover it up. What's going to happen? Is another seed going to come out? No. Something far more than what that seed ever could have been in its first life as just a seed. But you know, that shell, this flesh, rots off when that gets the scent of water and then something beautiful comes out of it. And that's the picture of the resurrection. So, you know, on day three of the creation, this is what God does. Now this has everything to do with what we're gonna talk about today relating to the number three. And again, when I first saw this, I, I, I was like, no, it can't be that, but it is. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Genesis chapter one, verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit 
after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. Notice this. We have grass, number one, herb yielding seed, number two, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. That's three. Three things that God wanted done on day three of, crea of creation. God is a God of order. If you, uh, this is just a piece of advice. If you find yourself in a church where everybody's rolling on the floor, bouncing off the pews, men and women walking all over each other like they're drunk and laughing and all of that stuff and say, bless God, we don't follow the bulletin in our service. Get out of there. God's not in that. God doesn't tell us to get drunk in the spirit. God tells us be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil. He's, he's there and he's just waiting to devour someone who's not paying attention. Amen. So God is a God of order. So he does three things here. Let me keep reading. Um, verse 12. And the earth brought, it's, look at there, it did what God said. The earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the third day. And see, and I, what I love about this the most is that all that happened is God said it and it happened. It's like in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. See, all God has to do is speak. And when God speaks, mountains move, seas rise or fall. It rains or it doesn't rain. When God speaks, whatever God says, it happens exactly the way God wants it to happen because you cannot stop God's word. It's, there's nothing more quick, which means alive. There's nothing more powerful and there's nothing sharper than the word of God. And I, I just, I'm a simple, simple guy when it comes to pastoring and preaching. Give people massive doses of the word of God Put in a little explanation, as little as possible. Give them some more scripture and let God take over. Let me ask you a quick question. What is it that governs our bodies? What is it that rules over every function of our bodies? What is it that produces more blood cells when we need them? What is it that produces uh, more skin cells when the old ones dry up and fall off and become dust in the house? What is it that keeps our, our, uh, our different glands glanding? What is it that keeps our heart pumping? What is it that keeps our lungs moving? What is it that makes sure that everything is working right inside of our body? It's a book that God wrote, Psalm 139, 16, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. He's talking about, David was writing about DNA 3,000 years ago, okay? And, and the DNA is what governs every system in my body. I don't, I can't make my mind say to my body, grow 18 inches, which is a cubit. Jesus said that himself. He said, you can't think and make yourself grow a cubit. Can you? No. But if it's written in your DNA, oh, you're going to grow 18 inches. Okay. So I'm just, just a little thing in here. Just if you find yourself lacking in something, you can try reading all the self-help books and so on, and you can try that. I did years ago. Didn't, didn't help. Then I started reading this seriously. It changed my life. And I didn't change my life because I read it. It changed my life. So now we got fruit trees. 
Okay? And we've, you see where I'm going with this? What's, what would be the next thing to look at after we look on day three of creation and we're going to look at fruit trees in the Bible? Where would I be going after that? I would be going to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2. There it is. Verse 16. This is God's given Adam this amazing garden and free food. I mean, he put him in the middle of the world's largest buffet and said, eat all you want for free. Okay. Genesis 2 verse 16. But just one, just one tree, just one tree. Don't eat from that. The Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. Doesn't cost him $4.99 or four pounds, 90 pence. Doesn't cost him anything, it's free. But, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And yes, you'll, you'll notice that there are 39 words there, which is 13 times 3. These are the words that God spoke, not the whole verses, but starting with of. And you can count them one by one. You'll find there's 39 words there. There is in my King James. And there's 39 books See, this is the law. This is like a, a proto-law. This is what comes and, and shows us what, what man is going to do in the future. Okay, so we have from here to here of God's commandments. Okay, 39 books. The first five really are the, the whole of the law, but we got a bunch of other things in here too. And 39 books, and man can't keep these laws. God gave Adam just one law. Just one. And lo and behold, Adam can't keep that one. Mm-mm. Adam couldn't keep it. His wife couldn't keep it. So you, you see, I hope you see what I see here. Wrapped up in this one commandment is the whole of the law. And what does James say about that? If a man offends the law in one point, he's guilty of all. You see that? If, if a man breaks the law, and doesn't keep the law in one point, like don't eat from that tree, he's guilty of all. So it doesn't matter what your sin is versus what somebody else's sin is. Somebody else broke the law, and when you sin, you broke the law too. But, oh, but, Pastor, but I, I don't, I mean, I'm not like they are. Oh, yeah, you are. You're more like the, what Read Romans 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. And you'll find out that just because you lie and you think that's okay, somebody else is cheating on his wife on a regular basis. And you think, that guy is so horrible, man. He makes me so mad. I can't stand him. And he's just cheating on his wife. That poor wife all the time. But you lie. You may only do it every now and then, but you're this, you're going to the same hell as this other guy. I mean, that's, that's just what the Bible says. So it doesn't matter if it's one law or a thousand of them or 10 of them, we break laws. Okay. And we do it. We do it a lot, a lot more than we think. Thank God we have a savior named Jesus who died for all those. Now, so far, you haven't really seen the number three yet, but I'm going to link it with sin and transgression. And yeah, see, I'm, I'm like, when, when that first came to me, I'm going, no way, not the number three. That's God's number. 
And I've started finding that with the numbers, a lot of times there's a, a, a good part and a bad part. Like the number six. Everybody says, oh, the number six bad. That's the number of the beast. Yeah, but um, in, what is it, uh, 1 Timothy 3, 16, great is the mystery of godliness. There are six things there that say what Jesus is. God uh, uh, came in the flesh. I don't remember the rest of it. But you look it up, there's six things there. And there's lots of things in the Bible that are six. Six is a number of preparation. Noah prepared the ark in Genesis 6. Okay, there's, read my book. Okay, so there's a, there's a negative to this, to the number three, but it's going to turn out good. I mean, you can't have a resurrection until you have a death. And what brings death? For as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So, God just introduced the idea of death in Genesis chapter 2 with 39 words. The law, 13 times 3. 13, that's another number that's got a good and a bad. You got 12 disciples and one Savior. It's 13, okay? But then you got Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and Abominations of the Earth. 13. We'll get there. Now, where we go next, third chapter of the Bible, and we're going to find out, and here, here's what may surprise you, the devil didn't speak three things here, but when he spoke, you'll see the number three afterward. Let's read Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, questioning God's word, doubting it, putting it in Eve's mind, that did, did God really say this? And why, why did he go to Eve anyway? Why didn't he go to Adam? Well, the Bible tells us, you know, Paul tells us that, you know, there's a reason why the serpent went to Eve. Number one is that she's the weaker vessel. Paul says that, okay, and it, and it is true. I, I've learned and seen with my own eyes that my wife is able to bear up under a lot of pain, but not much pressure. Whereas I'm a, the biggest crybaby in the world when it comes to pain, okay? But I carry a lot of burdens. Some of them I don't carry very well, but I carry them. And so in this, in this why, wise, in this way, the woman is the weaker vessel. But he goes to her also because she didn't physically hear what God said. In fact, she wasn't even around when God said this. God had not created her from Adam's rib yet. And so anything that she says to Satan, she hears secondhand from Adam. And we don't know exactly what Adam told her, but we'll see what happens when Eve gives her reply. It says, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden. Now, let me stop right here, too. So far, neither Lucifer, the serpent, or the woman has identified by name the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Neither one of I, now, I don't know why. I don't understand why yet. But I am noting here that Satan said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God is. Now we know that in the midst of the garden is the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
it matters which one they're talking about. And again, I don't understand why or what the significant is significance is of the fact that neither one of them has correctly identified what tree they're talking about. If it would have been Adam, Adam might have said, which tree are you referring to, Mr. Uh, Devil Serpent thing? Okay, didn't know you guys could talk. So Adam might have got into an, a little argument with him and said, uh, what, what are you trying to do here? But not Eve. Eve is kind of like going along with it. But of the fruit, verse 3 again, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. <laughs> now there, God, there, there's a whole lot of, I don't know what to call it. There's a whole lot of stuff mashed together here. And nobody is getting anything right so far because God never said, neither shall you touch it. Now, I can kind of imagine, you know, Adam getting to know his wife a little bit. You know, we dwell with them according to knowledge. And he's like, don't even touch it. Okay. Okay. And Eve may be thinking, oh, was that, did God say that too? Okay, but you forget about all that because none of that's in the Bible. We don't know. We don't know what possessed her to say, neither shall you touch it, lest she die. Nothing wrong with touching it. Nothing wrong with picking the fruit. Nothing wrong with climbing the tree. God just said you can't eat it. And we don't have to go into a Hebrew lesson and then and, and trace the word eat all the way back to its root to find out what it really meant. Everybody knows what eating is. Okay? So let's not play games like they're playing. They're dancing around the issue, but they're not. There's something. I'm going to study more on this, but let me get to the, let me get to the cold hard fact here. So verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Aha! Now we're, now we're getting some direct, front-on lie. Ye shall not surely die. That God said the exact words, In the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And the devil threw in just a knot in there. Just in the middle. Ye shall not surely die. Now, he's got Eve thinking, who's right here? It's kind of like you trying to read a King James, and then your pastor's up there with a message Bible. And you're like, I, I can't even keep up. I don't know where he is. I don't know what ver I'm waiting for him to say what verse he's in, hun, because I, I can't. Okay, you, you'll never figure it out. But he said, you shall not surely die. Now he's questioning for God doth know. Now he's going to introduce what I call the, the, the world's mystery religion. The secret doctrine right here. And that is, it has everything to do with the evolution of man. You say, you don't believe in evolution, do you? I, I believe in this case, I do. In this situation, at the, when, when it is time for everything we find in the book of Revelation and Matthew 24 and all these prophecies in the Bible, boom, they're going to hit and start Man's going to change. He's going to evolve. He's going to, um, he's going to be transformed. Okay, but it's not going to be a good transformation. It's going to be, yeah, we'll get there. For God doth know that in the day, here's the mystery doctrine right here. In the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. 
and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now he says the words, good, knowing good and evil. He actually says it. He says, you shall be as gods. Okay? And before that, you notice that I have the word eyes underlined. Of all the things that Satan says, that's the 33rd word that he says. Not the 33rd word of Genesis 3. But you take all the words that Satan said, put them together, there's 46 total number of chromosomes in our body. And the word eyes is the 33rd word. And if you look on any, any copy of Manly, or, um, um, Fat Albert Pike, um, Morals and Dogma, you're going to see that number 33 on there. Okay? The next video I make on numbers is going to be on the number 33. You don't want to miss that one, okay? Because that's a big one, all right? So anyway, but you shall be as gods knowing good and evil. So man evolving by eating this fruit, okay? And so now, now watch this. And, and just kind of look back at Genesis 3 here in the first five verses at all the things that the devil said and you will notice <clears throat> that at no time, number one, he's not even identifying the tree, right? And at no time did the devil ever say to Eve, go eat from that tree. He didn't tell her to do it. He didn't ask her to do it. He didn't push her. He didn't prod her like a, well, if the cattle prod, he, he didn't do, all he did was draw out the lust that was already in her. Because as he, he's, he says his words and he shuts up. You know, some people don't know how to do that. But the devil knew. He spoke the words, and he just sat back. And there was probably some other devils around, you know, that she couldn't see. And he's going, watch this. Watch what she does. And we'll see what she does. Because now, now here comes the number three. Genesis chapter three, verse six. And when the woman saw, number one, that the tree was good for food, Number two, that it was pleasant to the eyes. Number three, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. How silly. How silly for you and I and Adam and Eve to think that we can hide our sins from God. We can't. We never get away with it. Know ye not, okay, that whatsoever ye sow, that shall ye also reap. Be sure your sin will find you out. Okay? It happens. Trust me. So, here's the thing. Like I said earlier, the devil crafted, remember he's subtle, he crafted his words in such a way is that uh, it's just like a, a, you know, one of those spinning tops. I used to have one of those and you'd set it there and pull the string and it's okay. Only by the time I was a kid in the late sixties, early seventies, they had the, the tops with the little gears in them and you 
it had a rubber bottom on it and you revved it up real good and then set it there okay so that's all we had to do is just and set let it go and watch it for a while and say "Ooh, that's fun okay that's all he did he spoke his words and then just sat back and let the lust flow because you notice i counted three and saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. These three things here, believe it or not, every sin in the Bible is one or all of these combined together. That's all it takes, okay? Is for a man to, to for a man to commit adultery in his heart, what's it, all he got to do is stare at a woman down, and it's over with, and God knows you did it, so there's no hiding it. Okay, so um, does the Bible correlate this? Well, we got to have two witnesses, don't we, or three? So here's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden in Eve's mind and in her heart. This is what's going on right here. First John chapter 2. We have to go all the way uh, into the deep into the New Testament, almost to the book of Revelation, to, to figure this out. Let's look at it. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, let's count these. Number one, the lust of the flesh. Number two, and the lust of the eyes. Number three, and the pride of life. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. One, two, three. Let's let's do a quick compare here between Genesis three uh, and and First uh, John two. Let's okay. So number one, when the woman saw that the tree was number one good for food, look at First John two, lust of the flesh, good for food, make your belly feel good, right? Okay. Genesis back to Genesis three, number two, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. 1 John 2, lust of the eyes. Genesis 3, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Desire to be wise. Pride of life, 3. And they're in, they're, they're in the same order. Tree to, good for food, that's lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. Desire to make one wise. Pride of life. You see, now, by this time, I'm reading this, and I see that, that, that what the devil said, um, and I, I'm just, my mind is going reeling here because it just dawned on me. I started this thing out by saying, you know, when God said, let there be light, light happens, right? Okay, and he was specific about what he wanted. I want light. He didn't dance around like the devil, like the serpent did, with Eve on which tree are we talking about in the midst of the garden, okay? And then, you know, God said all these things about what happens on day three, and all three of those things, he said exactly what he wanted, and that is exactly what happened. But we notice that the devil did not say to Eve, I command thee to eat that fruit. You know, there used to be a comedian named Flip Wilson, and he used to have this character, and um, this it was like a woman named Geraldine or something like that, and, and he used to say, he, in his character, he would say, the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do anything. The devil didn't make you do anything that you didn't already want to do. The devil, it, he tempted Eve, and Paul said it plainly that we sin when we are deceived and when we are tempted. 
and then we sin. And it's just that easy. And like I said, the devil doesn't have to say, I command thee to steal that. Steal that $100,000 from your work. I command you to do it. He didn't do that. He says things like, Boy, wouldn't it be nice to be with that person? Boy, think about what $100,000 could do for you and your family. See, that's what he does. And he does it well. And he does it to everybody equally. We're all sinners in God's sight. Amen. Well, there's a remedy for that. And we're going to get to that, okay? So we've established here three things went through Eve's mind and heart. And those three things are the basically make are the makeup of every sin that can be committed. And I'm not going to spend time going through all the commandments and saying how, you know, whatever. Okay, but you, you get what I'm saying. Now, let's go back now and look at the results of sin because, listen, the devil may have convinced Eve that she wouldn't die if she ate the fruit, but he lied. There's always a judgment day. There's always a payday. There's always a curse that goes with our sin. Some of them, well, I'll say this. All curses are removed at the cross. Christ became a curse for us. Cursed is anyone who hangeth from a tree. Christ became that curse to take our curses away. And don't let anybody, no preacher, nobody on YouTube, nobody on Facebook, don't let anybody tell you that as a born again, Bible believing Christian, spirit filled Christian, that you can have curses on you because of what your father did. Somebody told me that just yesterday that he was told that because of his, the things his dad did, that he's cursed because of that. And he's got to pay for what his dad did. No, his dad died. And I guarantee you, his dad is getting what he did in this life. I guarantee it. Okay. So no, the curses are removed at the cross and you'll see how when we get there, when we ride this number three train. All right. So in Genesis chapter three, we have, of course, the three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And we have three characters, the serpent, the woman, and Adam. And all three are complicit. So there's going to be how many curses in Genesis chapter three? And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed. Look at there. Above all cattle and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Yes. The devil has an offspring. What? The woman has an offspring. Her seed, it says, her seed. And, you know, we all say that's Christ. Yes. And I would say us too. Roman, uh, Romans chapter 16. May the God of peace bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So I think Jesus is going to let us in on stomping the devil. Uh, and I'm looking forward to it. But it shall bruise thy head. Thou shalt bruise his heel. He's talking about. Christ here, the seed of the woman. So who would the seed of the serpent be? Hmm. Hmm. How about let's look in Matthew chapter 13. 
because Matthew chapter 13, I, I think I said this last time, is got is all about seed. I mean, there's the mustard seed thing in here and the 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 uh, the seed in the sower and then the uh, wheat and the tares. They're all in here. And um, when it gets to the parable of the uh, wheat and the tares, um, when we find out what it was about in verse 37 and 38, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. That's us. But the tares are the children of the who? Wicked one. That'd get any plainer than that. Between thy seed and her seed. There's enmity. See, my flesh does not want to obey the commandments of God. There, I said it. My flesh wants to violate everything that God wrote down in here. That's my flesh. That's why my flesh is going into the ground. And when I die, I'm done with it. I want the new body. I want that new body. Okay, so the, the devil's got a curse here. Um, he's got his legs taken off. He's got to lick dust all the days of his life. And that's what, by the way, that's what serpents do. When they stick their tongue out, we know this now. Because science has looked at the serpent's tongue. And instead of smelling what's around them, serpents and dragons, they, lizards, they stick their tongue out and they bring in the dust that's in the air and any particles that taste like f food to them, they stick their tongue out again to find out what direction it's in. See, nobody knew that till maybe, you know, 150 years ago or something like that. But God said it right. He said, you're going to eat dust all the days of your life. And science looks at this. Serpents don't eat dust. They're using well. We know that now, okay. But that's exactly what they're doing. They're eating dust. Anyway, moving on. Then we have the woman, Genesis three sixteen. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. See. I like verses with 316 in it because the opposite to Genesis 316 would be John 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. So that's two, two down, one to go. And unto Adam, verse 17, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Or in other words, because of what you did, the ground is cursed. And sorrow thou shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Sin. Three. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And you know, I got to doing... I, 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 like I said, I, I've written two books on Bible numbers, the King James Code, and by divine order, you can call our office and get uh, those books if you want. Um, but when I went back to do this, to you know, refresh my notes and everything like that, I'm thinking, I wonder, how, I wonder about this. And I'm finding things that I never found when I first did that work. That was all the way back... Night, uh, around the year 2000, between 2000 and 2000 and roughly 2010 in that space, I did two, those two books there. I'm finding things still to this day, like the word curse. I never thought of looking at the word curse. And I had the word C-U-R-S and then the asterisk. If you get our 
King James Pure Bible Search software. Download it for free. Macintosh, Linux, Windows. Um, you type that in and it'll look for every word with C-U-R-S and then anything after it. That's what the asterisk does, okay? So just the, the word curse with an asterisk is 207 times, which makes it three times three times 23. Isn't that something? So that same word in the New Testament is 23. 23 is the number of death. And curse in the Old Testament is also 23 times 8. 23 is the number for death. If Galatians 3, 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. See, I told you that Christ took all the curses, including all the stuff that my dad and your dad did. Jesus took them all to the cross. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8. Now, look at this. But that which beareth... In fact, let's, let's turn there. Let's turn there because I don't, Hebrews 6 is a, oh, people fight and argue over Hebrews 6. And I think it's, I think it's actually rather simple. If you look in verse 6, you have the phrase, fall away. Where have you read that before in the Bible? Okay. Uh, how about 2 Thessalonians 2. Uh, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Yep. So Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth, now pay attention to this, this is what God did on day three, right? For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, that's, that's one of the things he said on the third day of creation, meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But, that's what we have on the screen, that which beareth thorns, and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. What did God curse the ground with for Adam's sake? He cursed it with thorns and thistles and briars, okay? And all those prickly things that we hate that come up in our flower garden or our vegetable garden. We hate them. Those grow for free, okay? But we've got to work hard to plant the stuff that we want to eat. Revelation 22, 3, and there shall be, look at this, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Somebody say amen. Mm -mm -mm. Now, get ready. We're going to take a little walk through the Bible, okay? Be and th this, this was the part that really, w once I had it established in my mind that three could represent sin, um, you know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. I remembered that the Apostle Paul asked God a question one day. See, the Apostle Paul knew a man in 2 Corinthians 12 that was caught up to the third heaven. And he heard unspeakable things up there. And, and Paul's like, wow. And Paul then kind of recognizes in himself you know Paul for 14 years you didn't let anybody teach you the doctrines that you have except Jesus Paul says it in the book of Galatians and 
he basically says that Jesus himself gave him the doctrines of what make up the New Testament. And if we allow for Hebrews, Paul wrote 14 books of the New Testament. Now, somebody with that much knowledge and that much wisdom getting it directly from God. And we know a little bit about Paul before, you know, Christ that, I mean, he's holding the coats of them that are stoning Stephen and he's on his way now to go arrest Christians and have them killed. He's very, very proud. He's, he's a zealot for the law. I'm going to kill all those Christians. Okay. He's got a pride issue. We know that Paul didn't have to have a wife, so he didn't get one. And we don't really see any other sin that Paul is guilty of or admits to or anything like that, except pride. And he says in um, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 12, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn. That which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. It was given to him in his flesh. Now, that means it wasn't attached to his spirit or his soul. Our spirit and our soul leave this world. Our flesh stays here, and it's all going to get burned up in the end. That's what uh, Peter says in Second Peter. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now look at verse 8. How many times did Paul ask God to take the thorn out of his flesh? Three times. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Now why do you think that that has some big significance uh, for anything. And why, why is that even in the Bible? Why couldn't Paul just say, I, I prayed and prayed and prayed and got nothing from God? Why didn't he say it like that? Why did Paul get specific about the number? Because it's important. Because once you understand the number, you'll understand the thorn. For this saying, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, no, no, he didn't say that. God didn't, God didn't say no to us. He is, gives us something better. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, Paul knew after him asking God three times, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, I think pride of life was, was Paul's big thing. And after asking God three times, then God says, my grace is sufficient. He left the thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan. There was a devil that followed Paul everywhere he went and buffeted him. How? We can only guess. Maybe, it's, maybe he's talking about his eyes because he couldn't see. Or maybe it was something else. But the reason why I think Paul left it open, the Holy Ghost said, Paul, just write it like this, is so that you and I, who have thorns in our flesh, don't we? Not in our spirit, not in our soul, in our flesh. And I don't know how many people I've counseled over the years on the phone, face to face, or preaching, and told people, you've asked God to remove this sin from your life, haven't you? People, every, everybody says yes. And I believe them. Some, some people will say, well, you must not have asked enough, or you must not have had faith, or you, it's always some reason why it's their fault. God left it there for a reason. He left it there for a reason. God keeps us humble 
God keeps us on our knees. God keeps us with a broken and a contrite spirit. All those things, you know, God hates pride, doesn't he? Okay. God will forgive every sin that we've got. Okay. But pride, mm -mm. boy, he hates that one. Especially Christian pride. Bless God, we don't live like that. And we set ourselves up above everybody that we meet, everybody we do business with. We think that we are the kings of the world because we're Christians. And we think that everybody ought to bow to us and everybody ought to yield to us and everybody ought to give us. Mm -mm. You're a sinner just like I am. And you can ask God to remove it. Now, he may. I've seen God do it. Or he may just leave it in there and say, how about if I give you grace? Okay, grace, grace obviously was better for Paul than removing the thorn. After all, God is the one who put it there. Okay, God is the one who put it there. Amen. Now, how did Paul get it? That's the question. What's well, simple? I have right here on, on my left ear a very, very tiny mole. It's not brown, it doesn't have a hair sticking out of it, okay, six feet long. Okay, but it's just very, very tiny. I've had it there all my life. My mother had a bigger one. And when I was little, I used to ask her if I could touch it. And then she would always let me do it. And then she would say, you got one too right here. And she pointed it out. And she told me, that's how I know you're my son. I inherited my mom's mole. Now she had hers removed years ago. Okay, you won't, don't go up to my mom and go. Okay. She had it taken out years ago. But I still got mine. There are other things in me, on me, that are a result of my mom and dad and their mom and dad and their mom and dad before them. Let me get to where I'm going with this. Watch this. Okay. That thorn of Paul's, he inherited it. You inherited yours. Here's how it happened. Notice this. Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another, what? Seed, instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So now, let's look at this. Adam had... Cain first, and then Abel, but Abel's dead and bore no children. Cain was sent out away from Adam and all of his future children, and Cain had his seed and as far as we know, none of them survived the flood. And here's how we know this. I'll get to that in a second. But notice that Seth now is the surviving son of Adam. And everybody in the world came from Adam. Many of them, well, no. Everybody in the world right now came from Adam through Seth. All of the other uh, children that Adam and Eve had, and the Bible says they had, women, they had children after Seth, okay? They all perished. All of their offspring perished in the flood. Every one of them. And I'll, I'll show it to you. 
If you, if you look in Genesis 5 and look at the genealogy, it all goes back down to one man, Noah. Notice this, and these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his gener- perfect in his what? His generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat how many sons? Three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So, we have Adam, and then we have Cain's gone, Abel's gone. Now we have Seth. He's the third son of Adam and Eve. The third. Seth's line goes all the way down until it gets to Lamech. Lamech has Noah. Lamech has other children too. But they all perished in the flood. Only Noah. Of all the children of Adam in the world at the day that first began to reign, only Noah survives of the of the offspring of Adam, only Noah, and how many sons? Three. Mongoloid, Caucasoid, Negroid. I'm not saying bad words. These are the three primary races of men. Study any book on anthropology or any book on human population and how we got here and all this stuff, and there are three primary races of men, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid. And we have them from the people of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. My son-in-law, I asked him, I said, so who do you trace your, your people back to? He said, Ham. He just said it, just Ham. He knew that. Okay, so... His, his um, genealogy comes from Ham. And by the way, don't give me this stuff about, well, Ham's cursed. So that, keep your racism somewhere else. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. God so loved the world. Amen. You remember those verses? Shem, it's where we get the word Semitic or anti-Semite. So the Shemites are the people of like the Middle East and Asia. Japheth are like the Caucasoid. Okay? So right there you have all three races of men. And isn't it something that they survived the flood? And follow the line of sin. Adam had it in him. He gave it to Cain. Yep. And Cain, the first sin ever committed was murder. He murdered his own brother. Seth inherits sin in him. He passes it down all the way down to Noah. We know Noah was a sinner. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's how come he was saved. Grace. Isn't that something? Noah then passed sin down to three sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay? Now, Genesis 10, 32, last Genesis 10 gives you the genealogies. There's 72 families in there, okay? These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So now watch this. There's a verse that just came to my mind here. I think it's in the Psalms and it says, The wicked shall be turned into hell. And all the nations that forget God. You know what that that kind of means? What it really means? It means that it doesn't matter what race you are. If you forget God, you're going to hell. Because you're wicked. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. So all this, all this Hebrew, Israelite, white, Caucasian, uh, British Israelism and all this. Listen, I studied this stuff and I was like, I can't believe people believe this. Okay. They obviously don't read their Bible. Anyway, moving right along. So now 
we have one, two, three of the sons and everybody on the earth alive right now, some 8 billion people, man, it's growing fast. I mean, you got people in Australia, you have you know, two types of people in Australia, and you have the uh, Aborigines in Australia, you have the people in India, and then you have the people in uh, Pakistan, and then you, you move over into the Middle East, and you have all of those people there, and then the people uh, in Africa, and then you have the people in China and in the Asian nations, and then you have, uh, you know, Russia and Europe, and then, then you get over to the Americas, and you have the, uh, the Native Americans, and you have the, the native uh, South Americans and, and all those tribes that uh, what it seems, it looks like they came, you know, from the Pacific Islands. But anyway, they got over here somehow and all of those races, all of those people came from three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or a combination of the three, which means that all of them carry sin in their flesh. All of them do. We're born sinners. Now, we move down to, we're still in, in Noah's line through Shem, and we're going to go down to Abraham. Okay? Did Abraham need to be saved? Yes. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, the Bible says. So apparently Abraham was, well, we know he's a liar. He, he lied about his wife. Uh, don't, don't tell him you're my wife. Tell him you're like my, my sister. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And then they won't take you. But they took her. And then they're like, why didn't you tell her she was your wife? We, anyway, so we know Abraham was a sinner. He passed his sin down to Isaac. He passed it down to Jacob. Now, Jacob had how many sons? 12. And if we start here in Genesis 29, 32, we see Leah conceived, she bare Reuben. And then if we look in verse 33, she conceived again and she bare a son and she called his name Simeon. And then if you look in verse 34 and she conceived again and bare a son, so this is the third one now and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him. How many sons? three sons, and therefore his name is called Levi, because he's the three sons. So who was the third son of Jacob? Levi. Take a guess, just take a wild guess at what the third book of the Bible is. It's Levi. Ticus. Who is it named after? The third son of Jacob. And out of Levi, God chose them to be the priests to carry out the sacrifices. The book of Leviticus, Leviticus has exactly 27 chapters in it. Well, the New Testament has exactly 27 books in it. See, the book of Leviticus is a foreshadowing of the new covenant, whereby when you go to the priest, the Levite priest, and say, and you've got your family there, and you say, we have sinned. We have transgressed against God. Instead of the Levite taking out a sword and killing everybody in your family and you for sinning, a substitute was provided, a lamb. And the lamb was given and inspected to make sure it was without spot or blemish. And it was taken and the lamb was sacrificed and the lamb's blood was shed for the sins of that family. It, it, it is called in theological terms the substitutional atonement of man. In that, just like, just like when Abraham laid Isaac on the altar, thus fulfilling exactly what God, what God told him. God told him, offer your son. And he offered him. 
by putting him on the altar. He, God didn't say sacrifice him. He said offer him. All the other Bibles say sacrifice. They make God a liar. But then God stays his hand and says, Abraham, don't, don't do that. And when Abraham looks, there is a ram over there caught in the thicket and thus a sacrifice a substitute sacrifice was made and what is teaching us in the book of Leviticus the foreshadowing of the New Testament is that a substitute was made for our sins so that rather than us dying for lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life instead of us dying for that Christ died you see, a lamb doesn't have lust of the flesh. A lamb doesn't have lust of the eyes. And a lamb doesn't have any pride. So that's kind of the substitute part there. Is that the sub God substitute can't have had any sin. No lust of the flesh, no lust of the eyes, no pride of life. And that's who Jesus was. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And, by the way, 27, 3 times 3 times 3. Isn't that beautiful? And Leviticus, basically, speaks of the price. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? The price of sin. So Luke chapter 3 takes us now to a new priesthood because Christ didn't come from the line of Levi. That's an earthly priesthood offering temporary substitutes for sin, temporary sacrifices, which can never take away sin, the Bible says. Christ was born of, when we get into the number four, you'll understand it better. He was born from the fourth tribe, which is Judah. A different tribe, so it's a different law, and it's a different commandment. I love this. Luke 3.23, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. When he began his ministry, his priesthood, 30 years, okay? And then how long does he do it? 30, he does it about three and a half years. 33, we, we, we don't have a verse that says, and Jesus did this three and a half years. But they have counted, I've done this too, it's been a while, uh, the Passovers that are listed in the scriptures that Jesus attended. And so by reckoning those Passovers and the feasts and everything like that, that Jesus attended, we know that he was 33 years old. Okay. Some say, well, 33 and a half. Okay. 33 and a half, but it's still 33. No, no adult ever. When you say, how old are you? Uh, I'm 57 and a half. We don't do that, do we? Okay. So he was 33, wasn't he? Hmm. I like it. Look at this. Then Judas, Matthew 27, 3. 27 is 3 times 3 times 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the, how many? It's the price of sin. 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. 27, which is 3 times 3 times 3. In verse 3, Judas bringing back the 30 pieces of silver that they paid him for the lamb. Get it? Zechariah eleven thirteen 13 says, And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Wow. Matthew 27, 7, and they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field. Cast it to the potter. 
to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Mm -mm -mm. 30 pieces of silver. He's 30 years old when he starts his ministry. He's now 33 years old. Bought by 30 pieces of silver. Mm. You ever notice that there's two names for where Christ was crucified? It's Calvary, Golgotha. You want to take a guess? One of them is only mentioned one time. That's Calvary. Golgotha is mentioned three. Mark 15, 27, and with him they crucify two thieves, the one on his right hand, and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, he was numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Golgotha mentioned three times in, let's see, it would be, I think it's Matthew, Luke and John. I'm not positive, so don't quote me on that, but you look it up yourself. Golgotha mentioned three times, Calvary mentioned once. And then how many people died with him on that day? He had one cross on the left and one cross on the right. Mm. He was numbered with the transgressors. And you know what? The King James Bible is the only English translation of the Bible that has the fulfillment of the prophecy in Mark 15, 28. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. That whole verse is missing out of the new translations. When I say new, I'm talking about the modern ones. The NIV, uh, English Standard Version, Holman Christian Standard Version, um, uh, the Message Bible, all of the New American Standard Bible, both versions, all of those Bibles. They took verse 20, they took verse, verse 28 completely out. They don't have Christ in any place, anywhere, fulfilling Isaiah 53, he was numbered with the transgressors. And you see now how important it is that that's in there? Because it tells us that God does everything in order and that we have this whole thing of the number three pointing to sin, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. By the way, I didn't, I didn't say this. How many times was Christ tempted Uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Turn these stones to bread, lust of the flesh. Uh, lust of the eyes. See all these uh, kingdoms? No, let's see. Yeah, yeah, see all these kingdoms here? I'll give them to you. Lust of the eyes. Pride of life. Cast yourself down from this pinnacle here and the angels will come and get you up tempting God and Eve I like to make this thing I like to make this point Eve was sitting in a garden full of food if she wanted anything to eat she just had to like reach over and her hand would accidentally fall on something to eat in the garden of Eden that's how easy it was and it was all for free she wasn't even hungry and she went after that fruit Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days he hadn't drank water for 40 days. Not possible humanly. And yet the devil says, turn these stones to bread. I know you can do it. And Jesus, in his weakened form, doesn't even do that. 
He was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Tempted like as we are, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. The same way. He's victorious, which is why we will never get out of this earth without sin. There's only one sinless lamb, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. You want to take a guess at the last words that Jesus said? How many there were? John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said three words. It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And you know, I always heard from different preachers all while I'm growing up, even in Bible college, they would say that, well, the meaning of that is that uh, in, in, the, um, in the Levitical priesthood, they had a tradition. There's your problem right there. It's not in the Bible. Because I looked. I spent, uh, I, I spent time looking for this it is finished thing that the priest said. They would always come out and say when the high priest finished his work in the most holy, holy place, he would come out and say it is accomplished or it is done to everybody. And everybody go, yay. That's not in the Bible anywhere. I I looked. And I'm so I'm like, why did Jesus say it is finished? What what was finished? The Bible doesn't leave us guessing. So you type in it is finished. Type in that phrase. It's two verses in the Bible where it is. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And see, what happened when Jesus said, it is finished? He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And when you compare those two verses, they match 100% with each other. And Jesus taking our lust of the flesh, our lust of the eyes, and our pride of life, putting the thorns that represent our sin. Remember what the high priest would do with the goat? He would lay his hands on the goat's head and discharge the sins of Israel onto that goat's head. Well, they take thorns and they put them on Jesus' head. That's all of our sins, the thorns. Remember what Paul said three times? And when Jesus died, our sins died with him. I love this, but we're not done. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So this brings us now to, we have the death, we have the burial, the resurrection, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. It brings resurrection. Now, one more thing to show you. This actually was like the second or third sermon that I ever preached in my life. I'm about 16 or 17 years old, okay? And for some reason, this passage just jumped out at me. I don't know if I heard it somewhere or what. But I preached this. And just a 16, 17-year-old kid, don't know nothing like I ought to about the Bible. And But I got this. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat, and I used to laugh because it has the word fat in it. I used to laugh at it. Jehoshaphat's the king over Jerusalem, and he finds out that the Ammonites, Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites, they're from Mount Seir. That's the Edom, that's Esau's mountain, Mount Seir. Those three armies 
are all going to band together and they're going to try to invade Jerusalem and take it over. Okay? And um, Jehoshaphat, when he hears about it, he realizes they don't have enough equipment, they don't have enough swords, they don't have enough arrows, they don't have enough men to fight three armies. So you know what Jehoshaphat realized? It's what you should realize. You cannot beat sin. You cannot beat lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. You can't do it. Okay? So, Jehoshaphat calls unto the Lord, and he says, Now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. So these three armies are coming to kill them. Sin will kill every one of us, people. But wait a minute. He called unto God. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God sent word right then through the prophet. Listen to this. Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And here's what the prophet said. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, oh, they're coming to kill us. And you realize, listen, this is what happens when a man gets saved, or a woman, or a child. It's not, it's not you performing some ritual in a church somewhere or some building somewhere, wherever. It's you coming to the conclusion that you cannot beat sin, period. It's going to kill you. God made it impossible. So you call on the name of the Lord and God says to you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. God fought the battle between two other crosses having been sold for 30 pieces of silver in his 33rd year, died went to the lower parts of the earth for three days, rose again on the third day, lives forevermore, and he's coming back one of these days. And you know what? I love Jesus for that. For doing for me. I cannot do. I tried. And I still try. But Jesus succeeded in every place that I failed. You see the number three now in a different light? There's other places where you'll find like three enemies or three things trying to kill somebody or whatever. And just think of it that way and see how it turns out for you. Okay? God bless you. You're the reason why we do what we do. It's a joy to bring this to you. Keep us in your prayers always. We thank you for those prayers. We thank you for the help that you give us. And we thank you that God just joins us together through the pages of this wonderful, amazing King James Bible. I love it. 
and I love you too. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.